Aloha, this is Rob Hack with another edition of Exporting from Hawaii. I'm thrilled today to have with us in the studio here Aaron Lau from Simply Wood Studios and Lau Lau Woodworks. They make these fantastic pens that I have here in front of me and we'll be talking about the pens in a lot more detail. But first of all, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to talk about your exporting activities. But first, let's just talk about the history of you and Lau Lau Woodworks and Simply Wood Studios. So how did you start woodworking in the first place? Well, I was interested in woodworking when I was a kid. Uh, when my grandfather used to babysit me, he used to let me hammer nails and sand his little projects at home. So I was always interested in working with wood. And then when I was growing up and I was a an intermediate in high school, I used to build skateboard ramps. I used to be a big skateboarder that I used to wow. love skateboarding. Wow. Great. So, and then how did you, at what point did you merge the woodworking with the pen making? That was a, a huge progression where I used to be a financial planner and I, I wanted to take up another hobby, so I bought all this woodworking equipment. And I thought, oh, I want to make furniture. So I bought all this woodworking equipment, about $25,000 worth. And um, when I started making the furniture, I re realized how expensive the wood is here. And there's no way I could actually make some money doing this. So then I started making koa boxes, and I didn't like how exact everything had to be. Then I saw a two-page article on how to make a pen. So I just taught myself after that. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, when you say wood was expensive here, you mean importing wood from the mainland or wherever? Any kind of wood. Or even so just buying koa local wood, wood. Local wood is still expensive. Um, you know, even if we're bringing in mahogany or, or pine, getting that wood is still expensive as well. So when did the pen making actually start? When did uh, Lala Woodworks begin operation? So I first made my pen in, the first pen I made was 2002. And uh, then I was just kind of doing it as a hobby. And then um, I started doing it as a business maybe about 2003, 2004. Or part time, mm -hmm. I started doing some craft fairs here and there. Wow! And explain for our listeners what is the difference between Lao Lao Woodworks and Simply Wood Studios. So Lao Lao Woodworks came about because that's just my production and wholesale. And then I really got interested in doing retail, so I created Simply Wood Studios as a retail company um, in two thousand eight. So we have three retail stores in and around Waikiki. Oh, where, where are they exactly? So our first store um, was in, is on Kapuhulu. It's right across from Leonard's Bakery. Uh, that's, I opened that store 11 years ago. And then we have two other stores, one in the Royal Hawaiian Center by the Cheesecake Factory, mm -hmm. and then another one in the Ilikai Hotel Lobby. By Cinnamon's Restaurant. Which one do you consider the flagship store? Is there a main one that always has stock of product, or, uh, or they all do? Well, Royal Hawaiian, we have to be open uh, um, 12, 12 hours a day, right. seven days a week. But um, as far as stock, each store has a little bit uh, difference in inventory. So at Kapuhulu, where my workshop is, we have a lot of woodwork. And then in the Ilikai, we have mostly art, so two-dimensional art, prints, and things like that. And then in our Royal Hawaiian store, we have a good mix of both, but it's geared more towards carry take takeaways for tourists, Ooh. so it's not going to be larger items. But just to be clear, um, the wood that's there that isn't pens or the wood the woodworking and the art, that's not your art. No. It's so we are actually... In Simply Wood Studios, we only sell stuff like uh, art and gifts made in Hawaii. Well, that's great. We're, nothing's imported. Um, so I have over 90 different artists in, in three stores. Oh, that's great. What's the mix of those, say, roughly 90 artists, what's the mix of Oahu based versus neighbor island based? Oh, I don't know the mix. I mean, I have a lot of neighbor island. Um, I say most of the woodworkers are here locally because I don't have to ship the product from mm -hmm. <laughs> other sure. islands here. 
But for the most part, I would say 50% of the artists are, are from Oahu. That's great. And it, um, most of the art is Hawaii-themed art, I would assume? Uh, no, not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. There's, uh, there's artists that do more contemporary things. Um, however, like for instance, the woodwork itself, you can have a contemporary box or a contemporary bowl, but it's made out of local wood. Um, but a lot of the, the two-dimensional art, yes, those are, are Hawaii-themed. Okay. So let's get back to the pens because um, I just love these pens. Roughly 17 years ago, you made your first pen. Mm -hmm. Then approximately, when did you have your first export? Um, probably about 2003, 2004, I tried to export. Okay. Uh, I went on a trip to Japan, and what I did was I, I just went door to door to stores to see if they'd be willing to sell a koa wood pen. Um, that was a big, that was a big bust, but uh, you know that's when I fell in love with Japan. That was my first trip to Japan. Mm. And then um, what happened was after doing the craft fairs for quite a while and kind of getting a following. Uh, a lot of Japanese were going to those craft fairs. And then they started picking me up in Japanese magazines and things mm. like that. Bloggers and what have you. And well, they didn't have blogging back then, that's right? That's true, right? So it was uh, purely published Japanese magazines. And um, then they started to pick us up. And then I opened my first retail outlet, which was a kiosk in Ward Warehouse. Mm. It was right in the middle of the parking lot, and I set up a lathe outside of the kiosk where I would actually make the pens there. And the Japanese would come there, and more Japanese magazines picked me up. And that's when I started realizing the Japanese market was going to be a big market for me. Mm. Yeah. They do love writing instruments. They There's do. no question pens, about it. Pens, pencils, and fountain pens. I think a lot of people don't understand um, in the U.S. market that many of the pens that we buy at the store, such as Pilot and Zebra and what have you, all originated in Japan. Yes, Not all Japanese of them are. Japanese companies. Yeah, they're yeah. really fantastic. I think Japan quietly leads the pen market globally, but people don't really realize yeah, just that. just stationery in general. Yeah, Japanese love stationery. It's really fantastic. Um, okay, we'll take a break right now, and we'll be back in a minute, and we'll continue with Aaron Lau talking about selling these fantastic pens in overseas markets. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on Think Tech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and is streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Aloha, Rob Hack back on Exporting from Hawaii today with Aaron Lau from Lau Lau Woodworks and Simply Wood Studios. Before the break, we were talking about Japan specifically and the pens and um, the relatively cheaper pens that everybody buys, that uh, everybody can get them at Sam's Club mm -hmm. or Costco in Disposable bulk ones. or fish or yeah. what have you, um, the, those ballpoint pens and the gel inks and what have you. Those largely come from Japan. And now you're exporting these premium pens back to Japan, which yeah. I think is great. Oh, wood inlaid pens. So when, when did the Japanese market learn about Koa? You know, from what we saw when I first started making the pens, the Japanese didn't know much about Koa wood. They thought it was pretty, but they had no idea what was curly Koa, what was a premium wood, what was nice Koa. And then, I don't know the year, but right around when Jake Shimabukuro became popular in Japan, and the Japanese started to really like ukuleles. Mm. And then they started to know or learn more about koa wood through knowing what ukuleles are made out of. And then they became more sophisticated in knowing what, pen, what, what 
koa wood was nice. At first, the Japanese were buying the, the cheapest koa you can find because the Japanese didn't like a lot of figure in the wood. They liked mm -hmm. their wood looking clean. Right. But now, demand, not only in Japan, but worldwide, koa has become its own brand. And it's become a huge export for Hawaii. And now there's a huge difference in price point bec between curly koa and the, the cheaper koa because now everybody knows what's expensive and what's the good wood. Right, yeah. right. So when you're selling in Japan now, I've seen you at trade shows and what have you. Are, are trade shows important for your business? Trade shows are very important for my business. It's, it's way more efficient than trying to go door to door like it did my first trip to Japan. And when you're selling at a trade show, are you, you generally after wholesale accounts? Or are you selling Primarily, individuals? Yes. Okay. So I'm at the trade show in Japan that, that I, I see you all the time, that's primarily a wholesale trade show. And um, that's Tokyo International Tokyo Gift Show. Tokyo International Gift Show. Are there yes. others that you do? Not yet. I do do the Honkyu show, which is actually mm -hmm. uh, the department store, which is a direct-to-consumer right. store uh, show. Um, but it's extremely important, and I've learned so much just from talking to other businesses that go up with me to the trade shows and talking to all the people coming from all around the country to that show, mm -hmm. and I've learned a lot. And as you know, being based out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and shipping product around the world is not cheap yes. or easy. Yeah. Do you have that problem with pens? If somebody orders a, one pen from you? Shipping is cost prohibitive when it comes to just selling direct to a customer mm. because you're looking at at least $25 shipping one pen to Japan or even in, in to Canada and Australia, which are another big export for me. Mm. But um, shipping in general out of the U.S. is just expensive. When does it become more cost effective? At what level of shipment? Is it 20 pens or 100 pens? Or where it's, does it become more reasonable? It's more reasonable when, not necessarily a, a certain price point or a certain quantity, but just to ship in general to one location uh, with multiple pens at one time because shipping domestically in Japan is actually really cheap. Yeah, it is. And shipping domestically in Canada is very cheap. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you generally sell, uh, send from USPS flat rate box or are you using so another shipper? USPS flat rate for me has been the most efficient and, and uh, we can print out the label and the custom forms and then just ship that out straight to where the destination is going. Uh, you have Yamato and stuff like that for Japan, but mm -hmm. that's a little more time consuming for me. Right. Yeah. The paperwork mostly. Paperwork mostly and stuff like that. But the, the cost shipping uh, with USPS is actually, you know, pretty good. A, a typical wholesale order from Japan would be how many pens roughly? Um, the quantity, I'd say maybe the dollar amount would be eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars worth of pens, which would come out to maybe about twelve to fifteen pens in general. That would f ship great. in a flat rate, medium flat rate to a large flat rate box. And do you feel like your customer base in Japan? Do you have a feeling are they Tokyo centric or are they all over Japan? Oh, I have customers all over Japan. Yeah, they the because they're because we have three stores in Waikiki, we're able to see. Um, where our pens sell or who our customer base is. Okay. That's the whole benefit of selling retail. Let's hone in on that for a second. Who are the customers then from Japan? Are they men? Are they women? Are they young? Are they old? The great thing about my pens is there's no specific demographic as to who likes the pens. I, I can have a, a parent buy a, a pencil, a $145 pencil for their, their high school student's son. Mm. Um, I've had a lot of older people buy fountain pens or pencils. Um, there's no real demographic as far as, uh, a specific demographic as far as who likes pens. Do you find that um, uh, customers are buying these for themselves or are they buying them as gifts? Um, primarily. Can we zoom in on this a little bit? I love this. Uh, primarily the pens um, are bought by people that are buying for themselves because pens are very subjective. Mm. Uh, but um, I do get a lot of omiyage or gifts, especially for weddings and stuff like that, uh, wedding gifts. So the couples will buy 
a bunch of pens for their fathers and mothers and stuff like See, that. See, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's great. Um, and do they, do they sell them, would you sell a kit, like different sizes, for example? Like you had mentioned to me, which was a bit surprising to me, that it's very, but it makes perfect sense that women tend to like the bigger pens because it easy, well, so easily the, fits their The hand. cultures are different. Mm. So with Western cultures, Canadians and Australians and the mainland U.S., um, they, they like fatter pens. When it comes to Japan, they always gravitate, gravitate towards the thinner pen. And I have to have them test out the fatter pen to, to show them which one is more comfortable. Because generally speaking, fatter pens are more comfortable to hold. Um, when it comes to men and women, it doesn't matter on the size of the pen. Um, it's really the color that's more gender specific. Really? Yeah. So do women gravitate towards this? The pinks, pink? yeah. And Japanese like pastels. So mm. pinks, turquoises, things like that, they, they love. Um, Westerners, different market. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how each culture is different. So when you're exporting, you, you want to kind of, you want to retail as much as possible from your business to the consumer to see what you want to export to a particular country. So the wood is koa, and then what is the inlay that you, these So colors? this one right here, this is actually pink coral with resin. So it's reconstituted pink coral. This one here is reconstituted turquoise. These here are actually surfboard resin. Yeah. That's a polyester resin that we use to glass surfboards with. Those are really, really cool. And then all of my pens are actually chemical and UV protected. Mm. So the koa wood will not fade or change color. So when a, a customer, particularly a Japanese customer, sees that in the store, is there signage in Japanese that explains this is I surfboard? do have a lot of signage in Japanese. And I just got um, uh, my friend Toby just uh, translated for Korean. Oh, that's great. Because I'm getting a lot of Korean customers now. That's great. And you, you mentioned um, off camera that Koreans are just now learning about the quality of koa as yeah, well. Yeah, they just, it's just amazing. So I've been selling a lot of pens now to Korean visitors. And I asked them, do you know what koa wood is? And now over the past, I'd say just this year or maybe since December, a lot of them are, are nodding and saying they know what koa wood is. And I don't know how that's happening. I would think that um, a Japanese tourist or any tourist, but really from Japan because the Japanese market really loves surfing, that if they knew that that was reconstituted surfboard material that... Well, it's not actually reconstituted well, surfboard, but it's a, the same material. So I, I say softball or jushi, and then uh, they, they know. That's neat. That would, that would close the deal right there no matter what the price was. Are there um, his and hers sets? Do you, have you ever sold I do. I've like made... That? His and her sets, I make pencil sets, I make uh, letter opener sets. The Japanese love letter yeah. openers. So I do make um, letter opener sets. Now, how many different models of pens and pencils are you selling now? Uh, they primarily range anywhere from seven to eight different styles. Uh, sometimes I'll do a limited run of 500 of one, a new particular style. Um, and then I'll introduce another style. Are the limited runs more expensive? No. 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 Here's a classic uh, fountain pen design. And you said fountain pens are, are um, still very popular. They're actually more popular now than they were before because all the younger generation, particularly the Westerners, they um, are thinking that fountain pens are, are retro. Mm, that makes sense. <laughs> so that's what's that's happening now, the pens are more popular than ever because now the younger generation are now getting back into journaling and they're now getting back into um, writing uh, cards to each other. And everybody's so used to having an iPad or a phone or a, a laptop. Now with a pen, they can, they can show their own individuality or the uniqueness. What? Particularly because Koa pens and my pens are all different. Oh, each one is very unique. Yes. Right? I mean, it has its own signature yeah. built in. What, can you tell us briefly about the different models? So this is one of my limited editions. Uh, this one's a little more expensive because the hardware and everything like that is actually um, very expensive to make. Um, but this is just the premium Koa where you have that three-dimensional look to the wood. Uh, these pens, this is a fountain and roller ball. This is, uh, these are actually stone. Mm. These are reconstituted stone. Wow. These are all ball points here. 
And uh, all of my pens are, are standard refills. So you'll find the refill anywhere, Afghanistan, India, Hong Kong. I've sent my pens all over the world. And uh, nobody has come back to me saying they can't find a refill. What do you consider the flagship product right now? What are you selling the most of? Primarily ballpoints, but mm. fountain pens have picked up dramatically. How about in Japan? Is that true also? In Japan, it's primarily the thinner ballpoints and pencils. And the pencils, um, can they, do they, are they available in different? Uh, different pencil size? Uh, the widths of the lead. I have two different widths of the lead. Yeah, a 0 0.07 and 0 0.05. Okay, great. And, um, Stu back to school time or, you know, for college, I could imagine these would be considered really good or yeah, graduation well, present. Graduation. So right now, Japan. coming up um, from the middle of April through the end of uh, the middle of June or end of June is my second busiest time of the year. So in the U.S., we have Mother's Day and Father's Day. And in Japan, we have Golden Week and then um, graduation. So... Um, I'm glad to hear you're cognizant of the Japanese holidays because I think a lot of our companies here in Hawaii who are trying to export to Japan or other countries are not paying attention to the holiday schedule in yeah. those countries. It's really, like I said, it's really beneficial for me to have my three retail stores mm -hmm. because we have the Japanese customers coming to me and I personally talk to them or my customer, my my salespeople personally talk to these Japanese customers. Mm -hmm. um, that way I can go to my wholesale accounts in Japan or these, the, the stores that want to sell my pens and I say, hey, look, the Japanese people love these pens in Hawaii and now, they want to, now it's beneficial for them to get it in Japan. So there's no, in, in the Japanese market, there's no exclusive agent. Uh, anybody can sell them wholesale, if yes. they buy from you wholesale. Yes, I do have some agents like in, in Osaka and stuff like that. But um, that's primarily because they, the, the company does not have an English speaking right. uh, person. And the street price in Japan, retail price. It's usually 20% more than what the retail price would be here in Hawaii. And is that largely based on shipping costs? And shipping costs you? and if there is any customs charges, yes. But uh, primarily fishing, uh, shipping costs. Have you run into any customs issues in the years you've been doing um, this in Japan? No, we actually just had one issue just come up recently with a large order. Uh, it was held up in customs. I don't know what the reason was, but uh, it got released like a month and a half later. So it took Ooh. a while to get to them. And no um, explanation of what it was? No, because it was all in Japanese, so I couldn't really tell. I think it's because, um, well, this is processed wood, right? Meaning you've done work on it. It's yes. not raw wood. Not I raw. think if you were doing raw wood oh, yeah, shipments anything. to you Japan. You can't ship you... that to Japan, or you can't ship raw wood to Australia or Canada. Mm -hmm. And now you, you said you're selling more in Canada and Australia. Um, is, is that also fueled by Canadian and Australian tourists who come here first? Or? Yes, yes. Primarily, um, I always try and see what the retail market is looking like when they're coming here. Mm. And uh, the great thing about Australians and Canadians is they love wood yeah. right off the bat. Right. So that's, that's their culture. Just the same thing with the U.S. People in Hawaii and in general love wood. And... That's why the wood pens are so popular. And since koa is only found in Hawaii, it's, it's a perfect keepsake for them to take back home. That's great. Um, do you find that most Australians, Canadians, or even American tourists, do they understand koa? Do they know what koa yes, is? Yes, they do. Yeah. If they've been like here once or do. twice, they'll know what koa wood is. And, and it, it's kind of a double-edged sword where Koa has become its own brand mm. where you can go to these hardware stores and you can get quote-unquote Koa flooring even though it's yeah. probably not Koa. Right. Um, Koa is, is only found in Hawaii. So all these companies are marketing their wood as Koa wood because a lot of people associate Koa with Hawaii and it's, mm. it's premier and ex expensive pricing. So we have to... as suppliers from Hawaii, we need to watch out for that copying yeah, so of koa. One of our biggest problems right now in Hawaii, as far as exporting wood, is the local woodworkers can't get it now. Mm. I, I didn't talk about this, but all the wood is just being cut 
and thrown into containers and not being milled in Hawaii and not being lumbered in Hawaii. And the problem is with that is the Hawaii local woodworkers can't get the wood itself. It's being shipped to China, California, Japan for veneering and lumbering, and we can't get it. All right, difficult problem. We'll yeah. work on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that wraps up another episode of Exporting from Hawaii. I'd like to thank very much our guests today, Aaron Lau from Simply Wood Studios and Lau Lau Woodworks for bringing some of his fantastic pens that I highly recommend and uh, explaining to us some of his exploits in exporting, particularly to Japan. So thank you very much for being here. Thank Mahalo, you very much. And we'll see you again in two weeks from exporting from Hawaii. Mahalo. Uh -huh.